three are one and the same. One, because the Holy Spirit is truth. It's giving out the Word of God. If you tell people that Christ's Mass is paganism, you tell them it's Roman Catholicism, it's eating human flesh, and when Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, and then he tells you what it means. It doesn't mean to eat literal flesh. It's against God's law, according to Leviticus, the 17th chapter, to eat any flesh and drink any blood. Well, if you eat flesh, the, what are you going to eat of? Jesus said, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And indeed is the word A-L-E-T-H-E-S, alethes. Alethes means of truth. We get the word Alethes comes from aletheia, truth. So you're eating of the Word of God. Here's why these three are the same. I don't think I've ever said this before. Huh? Huh? A-L-E-T-H-E-S, aletheis. That means of truth. Well, that comes from aletheia. Well, when you eat and drink of truth you pull the cover off and you don't hide anything. That's what you do. And when you pull the cover off, that's Holy Spirit being the truth, being the Word of God. You pull the cover off the Word of God and this makes men want to kill you and put you in the blood baptism. You see that? And then that continues all the rest of your life as you tell the truth and that is a refining fire Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Strange is the word X-E-N-O-S, kazenos. It comes from X-E-N-I-Z-O, and that means an occasional guest. That's what a stranger is, is an occasional guest. God says, Peter said, don't you think that this fiery baptism that's coming your way is an occasional thing? It is daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is not a matter of choice. This is what we have to do every day. So blood baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, baptism by fire, they are all one and the same. You see, I don't think I've said that ever. Don't ever remember saying it to you. I'm thinking it. Y'all supposed to read my mind. Okay. <laughs> now. Now. All right, I've got so many things to tell you. Now, but people say, well, the Bible, how in the world could this be true uh, if having the truth, having the Word of God, they didn't have it over here in the Old Testament? Yes, they had the Holy Spirit. When the Bible speaks of the Spirit is not yet given, it's talking about the Holy Spirit wasn't yet given to the apostles in order to cause them to preach they were brand new babies. Just because a person is a believer, it don't mean they're filled with the Holy Spirit yet. It, you can be brand new believer. It don't mean you understand all the Word of God. Well, they, no, you just come to knowledge of Jesus. How old are you? Five. Quote some Bible to me. No. No, they don't know any Bible yet. They're babies, aren't they? Now, we're talking about Holy Spirit baptism. Was Paul baptized? Here's what really gets me. When John is baptizing in the third chapter of Matthew, and he said, I baptize with water, but there comes one after me, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Well, after that, after those verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, everybody forgets Holy Ghost baptism. For some reason, they think when they run across baptism, well, gosh, in America, we think of baptism as water. That's what this must mean. Huh? Do you, which one of you, these do you think is most important? H2O or truth? truth? Well, certainly truth. Truth that has to be the only real true baptism. The water was nailed to the cross with Christ. They were still baptizing some people in water. They were still washing some people in water. But Paul said it's time to quit this. I'll go back into that in a minute. But look here. Look over here in Mark. Let's see if, in, excuse me, in Acts 9. Let's see if Paul was baptized. Acts 9. I've got to finish this. And I've got to get on with what the Holy Spirit does. Acts the ninth chapter. 
Acts 9, now this is, Paul is on the Damascus road. He's breathing out threatenings and slaughter in verse 1. And then uh, he's knocked down by some great bright light. And Jesus is talking to him. If you've got a red letter Bible, you notice the red letters. That's Jesus talking to Paul. And the Lord tells Ananias there in verse 10, uh, he, well, he says, There's a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias to him. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and acquire in the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And of course, Saul's name is changed to Paul. And Paul becomes the greatest writer of New Testament Scripture. Well, let's look down here in verse 17. And Saul, Ananias, goes into the house. Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest do two things. Receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now when you read these men, when you read these men, receive your sight. All right. These men will tell you that to be filled with the Holy Ghost, that that is also a baptism because it is aspersing the blood of Christ on the inside. To drink of a cup had the same idea, had the same meaning. In fact, uh, Mr. Dale will tell you, he will tell you that drinking of a cup was a baptism inwardly. Well, I think of the ark. The ark, ark was pitched within and without. We're baptized outwardly by the acts of our lives and inwardly we're baptized. We drink the cup, drinking of a cup, had the exact same meaning as baptize or a blood baptism. It meant to undergo a death. So you're pitched within with the Word of God. That's what this is about. Now look here. So there's two things. Ananias came so that Paul could receive his sight. And that's a... Receiving sight is a picture of us being able to see the truth. You remember over there? Remember over there when uh, Jesus, in the 13th chapter of Matthew, he was talking about, I'm going to give these people eyes that they can't see and ears that they can't hear. You remember, idolatry means to serve what you see. Well, if we serve God, then, then idololatria applies to Christ. We serve Christ that we see. But most people look out here at the world, the reason... The reason we live in Babylon, the mother of all idolatry, is look at what they're putting in our eyes and our ears in America. Look at the TV. Look at the billboards. Look at the magazines, the radio. They're putting this in front of our eyes and our ears. And the Bible says, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, Ecclesiastes 1 and 8, nor the ear filled with hearing. The mouth will not simply utter it, we won't say, I like that woman, I like that man, I like that car, I like that ring. Our bodies will labor to fulfill what we put into our eyes and our ears. Won't it? We do labor for it, don't we? Oh, I got to have that. I got to have that car. I'm going to do everything I can to get that. I want it. And what is that called? Covetousness. Covetousness is idolatry, Paul said, Ephesians, Ephesians uh, 5 and 5. Covetous, a covetous man is an idolater. Covetous is the word pleonectes, P-L-E-O-N-E-K-T-E-S. That word means want more. Has anybody here been an idolater? How about everybody here? Want, I want more. Then what I've got, Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am, there were to be content. Philippians 4.11. Now look here, let's see. Two things. First, to receive his sight. Number two, filled with spirit. What's he filled with? Truth. Truth, word of God, word. He's filled with taking the cover off, isn't he? When you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to rip the cover off. And tell people the truth. That's what you're going to do. But look at the next verse. 
And immediately these two things happened. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith. Number one, that happens. And arose and was baptized. Huh? You actually believe this is water, H2O? No. To pitch within is also baptism. He was baptized within, with the truth, with the Word of God. That's what, but let's look at another account. Paul is repeating this account. Let's go over here to Acts, the 22nd chapter. 22nd chapter. He's recounting this before some Israelites. And Ananias, verse 12, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, God of our fathers had chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Now notice, Ananias tells him in verse 13, Receive your sight. That's the first thing that he came for, isn't it? And the other is to be filled with the Spirit, right? And he called that a baptism there in that ninth chapter. But look here what he says now. So in the context here, he tells Paul, Receive your sight. And what's the second thing he's supposed to be? Filled with the Spirit, which is a baptism. Look here in, let's continue reading here. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men. I want you to notice what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. You become a witness. Witness. Witness is the word M-A-R-T-U-S. We get the word M-A-R-T-U-R-E. You become a tour and we get the word M-A-R-T-Y-R. A martyr is one who dies. You will die the death. But look at the next verse. And now, this is Ananias talking to him. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise. That word arise, A-N-A-S-T-A-S. Now, it's not I-S. That's off of it. That's because it's a form of anastasis. And anastasis, anastasis is the word resurrection. This word here says resurrect. It's actually a participle. A participle is a verbal <coughs> adjective. Adjectives are descriptive words. They tell which, what kind of, or how many. This talks about the arising Paul. The resurrecting Paul. Resurrect means to come to life. Come to life after dying. And how often do we die? We die daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we're dying daily. He's not telling Paul. Well, let me show you something that's really interesting about this. This is an aorist tense verb. Or aorist tense participle. Being a participle, it has character. He, is, he says, Ananias came to me and told me to arise. It's aorist tense. That's past tense. That means he has already been arising and he's telling him, you've been arising, continue. The aorist tense is not a simple past tense verb in the Greek. You've got what you call an ingressive. I'll, the, I'll give you just a couple of them here. You've got simple past tense. Simple past tense. And simple past tense is consumative. Consumative past tense. That means it happened one time in the past, it's over. Boom. The guy next door died. He's not dying today. He died. He's dead. He's physically died. But then you have an ingressive.